roots were divided. Long, long ago. It started off when the invaders had brought war, trade, and disease to its shores. They had also killed some of their own people through the Salem Witch Trials and through other tribunals that accused people of being traitors or anti the group. But where did these ideals come from? Why did some colonies or settlements disappear? The Northwest Territory. That's all there was before there was an Ohio, Kentucky, and Indiana. Land to be conquered, people to be slaughtered. All based on manifest destiny, telling the people from the old world that this was new and ripe for the taking. It didn't matter who had lived here. It didn't matter their families. We knew there were cultures, because previously the missionaries were making peace and trade. But that wasn't enough. And even though the same pattern has happened globally to many different peoples, today I want to focus on here. In Ohio, here's a piece of Adena art on the left, and also an artifact from the Mayan Empire. Look at the similarities. Facial expressions, headdress, ear gauges. Are they different cultures? When we look at this image, this is an earthwork in Newark, Ohio, just outside of Columbus, marking different celestial events. We might have one here in the center of our own city. Looking at this map, you can see that much of downtown as we know today hadn't even been built. But there's these little dark markers and a circle right there where Vine Street and Fifth intersect. Now look at this image again. We have a circle, we have these posts or these other smaller circular objects and a pattern. Now look here again at this topographical map right there in the center. Do we have one of these structures stretching across all of downtown? Do the indigenous people know the importance of this region? Clearly they did. Maybe it's this is why the settlers might have found some importance in this region. Each time that you've gone to Fountain Square, did you ever think about the indigenous people that lived here? the original settlers, what this land was like before it was established, quote unquote. No, that route was cut off from us. But it's time to bring it back. Bacon's Rebellion. This was the time in history so little is talked about. But this is when European and African slaves they bonded together against the oppressive practices of the system. They weren't getting their equal share in the land for the people that they were helping to conquer, for the trees they were cutting down. This rebellion lasted for one year. The best mercenaries from Europe eradicated all of those people and created a new system, saying that those of color and those of European descent are now separate. That is where we got the things like the Virginia Slave Codes. That's when we also had the Ohio Black Codes that even came about later. Things that allowed people to mistreat those of African descent. The institutions had even taken these ideals on and taught them in school through the concept of eugenics. That those of British or other European groups that were accepted had a superiority because of their genetic makeup. We understand today that that is false, but how many people still hold on to it? How many hate groups do we have around our region that continue to perpetuate these ideals? Are we really that different from each other? Our histories? Our families? Yes, there are pictures of us in chains. An unfortunate truth is that all cultures have been in chains at one time or another. Fort Washington, the war platform that stopped indigenous resistance. It made a new area for people, but not everyone. The area of this fort is actually located somewhere between 3rd and 4th and Broadway. 
The roadway that marks and gives homage to the site is actually Fort Washington Way, which stretches from the Lytle Park District all the way over towards the west side of Cincinnati. You probably crossed this road going to a Reds game or a Bengals game and just didn't know it. Somewhere from over in this direction. The next time that you're downtown, just think back. Who was here? What was happening? We do have the World Series, which was invented here, as well as professional baseball. But what did the people that first settled the land see? Was the ideal of peace really war? Did the original settlers have freedom, or were they constantly fighting in fear? That is what I want to look into. The roots of our ancestries leading to the way that we operate today. It does have an impact. We are not separate from our tree. Now, many of us might believe that races come from countries, but that's actually not true. We've just been having these ideals reinforced to us and altering our perception of what humanity is and what our actual differences are that should be cherished rather than feared. Do we only want to learn the world through images or do we want to see what it is for ourselves? As we all know, the United States of what we know today was split amongst different European powers, all fighting for one thing. But in war, fear is created. Always. You could talk to any soldier. And that's why they have those traumatic impacts, and those things could be handed down. The constant shelling. Being attacked and being the attacker. The side effects of war, constant paranoia and eternal trauma. But those are the roots that founded this nation. There was a portion that was left for the others, but it was soon taken by people like this, one of the most vicious members of American history, and one of the founding members of a society that gave Cincinnati its true name. These atrocities have left us artifacts, but no other remnants of the people. They are all gone. That is an unsurmountable pain. All we have to do is open our heart to empathy. An entire culture erased because of fear. Things that we have ingrained into human history that we have to heal from. Not be upset when the truth is revealed. Things hidden and misconstrued lead to further divisions. Outside of the National Underground Freedom Center, you could see a piece of the Berlin Wall. I was a child when this had come down. Do we recognize our own walls of prejudice? Was the Mason-Dixon Line our beneficial wall that kept back the throes of slavery and kept those that made it to the North safe? When I looked into the history, it was hard to find information about black settlements in Hamilton County. So let's go back to the roots of where it started. Now the Sims Purchase, made by John Cleve Sims, is where we get Sims Township in Cleves, Ohio. But he actually tricked many of the original settlers into selling them land that he did not himself own. The federal government no longer sold large parcels of land like this to real estate investors. That purchase gave root to Fort Washington, which pushed the indigenous population back and allowed the Northwest Territory to further expand into Ohio, Indiana, and Kentucky. Settlers started to move here and establish businesses and homes because the indigenous threat was no longer there. The people had been eradicated. And also, black people were not included in this history 
In the year 1800, I found that there were only 337 blacks in the entire state of Ohio. Put that in perspective. Were we allowed to come here freely? I think many more would have. The Virginia Slave Codes gave way to something a hundred years later. All because our ancestors decided to work together and say no to oppression. No to further killing. And they were called the Ohio Black Codes. These codes closed the door on our freedoms. Black people from the South were not allowed to come to Cincinnati freely. If it weren't for the Underground Railroad, we might have been erased from the history completely. We were forced to move into some of the most inhospitable and toxic environments, those that were the closest and the least safe, but right next to the industry where we could work. In 1819, our population increased to 410 blacks in Cincinnati. Around this time, we have the first black church, Allen Temple AME, a huge part of my own history. By the year 1826, there were 690 black people living in Cincinnati, Ohio. Just three years later, the Lane Seminary was built in 1829. This educational institution was very important in raising black leadership that was educated amongst the ranks here in Cincinnati. Most of its graduates went on to do many great things. In that same year, the Race Riot of 1829, this act created a deep wound in our city's course of history, having a profound impact on the diaspora of people of color leaving the South but settling further north of Cincinnati. The reason for this violent outbreak was a dispute between the poorest working classes competing for jobs, the Irish, Germans, and the blacks. A group of white men gathered in the night and brought with them a cannon and shot it towards the homes of Bucktown. Law enforcement did not step in to protect the citizens, and many homes and lives were lost. After this, thousands of black people left the area and went onwards to Canada. They heard that there was more racial tolerance in Canada. This was ironically a historical marker toward where the sympathy towards the blacks had been invoked upon the citizens of Cincinnati. For blacks, getting here was just one barrier. Crossing the river and having a place to live was inhibited greatly. Residing in the city was met with a lot of legal restrictions. The businesses in the north of the Ohio River made profits from the whip of the enslaver of the south. None of the original black neighborhoods exist in Cincinnati from this time period today. Not much different than some of the recent historical events in Cincinnati in terms of neighborhoods being erased. Blacks fleeing the oppression of slavery faced other legal hurdles if they tried to live here in Cincinnati. Current citizens had to provide written account of their character. They would have to pay a $500 bond to the city, promising to not get in trouble. $13,000 in today's money. A $100 fine to anyone who harbored a black fugitive. All informants would get 50% of the bond or any other fee. They were prohibited to testify against any whites. And any violation of the law, that they would forfeit the bond and they'd be banished from the city of Cincinnati. Just for a chance to try to live here. Could you imagine buying a $13,000 lottery ticket and those controlling the game don't want you to win? Leaving one cheating game is just to go play another. During the period of 1833 to 1836, the situation with racial tensions in Cincinnati had grown worse. There were more and more Negroes driven from the South by intolerable conditions. But to solve this problem, people were coming up with schemes to buy large plots of land and have the Negroes move to different counties or states. But such a method, however, seemed rather slow to the militant pro-slavery leaders who had learned not only to treat the Negroes as an evil, but to denounce in the same manner the increasing number of abolitionists by whom it was said the Negroes were encouraged to immigrate into the state. They wanted to keep the status quo. 
Furthermore, people that were leaving the life of slavery and trying to come into the region were denied employment by those that were native born. They would usually have to go to people that were previous slave owners in order to try to find a job. And this article reflects that. This article sheds light on the demeanor of the citizens of Cincinnati and how they would treat the Negro coming from the South, regardless of skill or position. The Race Riot of 1836 In April of 1836, Mr. Burney, an abolitionist, had his print destroyed. It was called The Philanthropist. He was one of those allies that looked at human beings as human beings and saw that there was no distinction in a person and their capabilities outside of what they can show in their character. He tried to sway the minds of his fellow citizens, but this was the result. Again in July of 1836, we get an account from the famous Harriet Beecher Stowe. Take a moment and read it for yourself. After violence was allowed to go free, the city tried to put a cap on it. But the fear had already set into all of the communities. Even though it, the attacks were against blacks, the story was twisted and manipulated to mean other things. By the year 1840, 2,225 of the 46,000 citizens were black. We were such a small piece of the pie hiding out on the outer edges of the banks, but not included in any of the glorious upcomings of the city. Maybe as laborers and those behind the scenes, but rarely at the forefront. The tree of eugenics, further rearing its head and giving a lot of fuel to the pro-slavery leaders, which helps separate all of the public places and schools, separate places of worship for blacks and whites. No opportunity for our kids to learn together or play together. By the year 1850, out of the 115,000 Cincinnati citizens, 3,237 of them were black. Most of those citizens had to live in areas such as Little Bucktown, Bucktown, and Little Africa as you can see, their proximity to Mill Creek and the river, where most of their jobs were. But taking a look on the west side at Little Bucktown, look at the density. You can't see the pollution or the strife, but look at the density. These areas were thought little of and always looked down upon and made it easy for areas like the Kenyon Bar to just be removed from the map. And here's what it looked like. Just imagine all of those families and then it being gouged and raised for the freeway. What was it about being black that we had to be hated? Why were we feared? We were such an integral part in building the nation into what it is today. The Black Brigade of Cincinnati we should have all learned about them in school, but we did not. But we have the chance by going down to Smell Park and visiting their memorial. Understanding that after all of the mistreatment, after all of the setbacks, that the black citizens of Cincinnati 
were the ones who helped turn the tides of the war. The Civil War. If we did not win here in Cincinnati, what we know as America today, even though it might not be all the way where it needs to be, would have definitely been a different picture. There are many twists and turns to the story. Even though we built all of the fortifications and embankments that helped turn the tide of this war, the Black Brigade of Cincinnati was not a volunteer group initially. Blacks were not really even invited to partake in the Civil War. And we thank Mr. Clark for documenting those things, of which Clark Montessori has been named. City Council had asked that every business, every business owner, and every worker assemble and prepare for the biggest battle of their life. The South was coming. The white citizens of Cincinnati were able to join and volunteer and get the rights and the benefits of what it meant to enlist. When the black men showed up, they were turned away and told that it was the white man's war to go back home. Now we were all taught that the Civil War was a war that was fought over slavery, but black men were not allowed to participate. Abraham Lincoln was in his last years of his life making the Emancipation Proclamation, an ideal that was definitely not accepted by all, but was not under the moral guide of slavery being wrong. Many Southerners lost their lives to protect the institution of slavery, or what they say was the freedom for their state's rights. Even though we were not allowed to volunteer, there came a time when we were taken from our homes in the middle of the night, under force, to fight this war that was impending. Being forced into a fight they were told they were not welcome. A similar march as to their ancestors being forced to the fields. This already set a new layer of mistrust between families and the government that was supposed to protect them. The trauma was set in with distrust with these families, fear, terrorism. The men were forced to crouch. They weren't allowed to sit or stand. And if they were to fall over, they would be shot in the head. They were treated still as slaves, not free. But imagine being told you cannot fight and then kidnapped out of your home by force. The abolitionists helped get the word out and the Cincinnati Daily Gazette helped report this to the masses and people were abhorred at the way that the black citizens were being treated. New leadership was sent in to help organize the ranks. And they were all sent home in hopes that they would come back and volunteer in the next day. Dixon sent all of those men home in hopes that they would return and volunteer the next day. And guess what happened? 300 more black men showed up then were abducted the previous night ready to fight ready to fight for any sense of equality or freedom that had never been afforded to them before they created the works the embankments and fortifications that protected the city and changed the course of the civil war no guns just a sheer presence of unity and when the scouts were able to see that there were black men behind the fortifications alongside white men, the South turned back. Not a shot was fired. Not a life was lost that day. Just because we had fixed the division, that should have never been there in the first place. We worked together for a common cause of good even though it was overshadowed by the bloodshed of warfare.
know the truth helps set one free. To know that you have value. To know that you have worth. That if you put your mind to it, you can stop anything or produce anything. No matter how great or how grave something may seem to be. That our ancestors had a vital role outside of the movies and the textbooks. That they themselves, despite oppression, decided to go and achieve a victory for all. After which, they were able to hold up their heads high, explain to their children why they did what they did, and the ones that tried to prevent them held their heads in shame. The Black Brigade honored Dixon with a sword, acknowledging the humanity that he had shown them. A gift, though humble, had great significance. A gesture of peace and camaraderie. A potential for the future to show that the misconceptions of eugenics, of slavery, of prejudice, don't help build a nation, but only tear it apart. Though the battle had been won, the roots of division had already been sown in. Growing and growing preventing some from seeing the bridge that linked us together for the success that we are able to see and experience today. To be under one name, Cincinnati. What would this place have been like if the Black Brigade did not participate? If the South would have won? If we didn't have outstanding citizens like Mr. Clark document the actions and inactions that were taking place at that time? but it came with consequences. These are actual images of black leaders. But when it came to propaganda and the precursors to Jim Crow, our images started to be replaced by cartoon images. Things that showed us in the form of buffoonery or would fit the stereotype and the prejudices, but not the actual of what was taking place or had been taking place for centuries. The minstrel show was a devastating blow to many of the black people trying to seek freedom. Because for whites who were segregated from the black population, many times this was the only information they had. Even though we were still described in obscurity, those images were very important. Images like this reinforced the perpetuation of stereotypes that we were lesser, always to be the servant. Minstrel shows were very popular in the South, but just as popular in the North. We were taught that Abraham Lincoln had fought on the ethical values because he despised slavery. He would have done anything to preserve the Union. Even though freeing the slaves was not done on moral principle, it was definitely a military strategy to destroy the South. But if slavery had ended in all of its forms, Will we still need civil rights leaders today, demanding rights, sacrificing their lives? All because someone decided to create a false science and utilize politics, geology, and history to manipulate where we are to go as a nation. A tale of two groups of people, who is and who is not worthy to be a citizen. And where do they get to live? These were the roots that developed the rest of the neighborhoods of Cincinnati. Starting at those riverbanks and moving out into a nice growing mushroom type pattern. And today, we're going to dive deep into what made these neighborhoods what they are. Some of the historical characteristics and those of the present day world. And see how they tie into the past, present, and hopefully into a positive future. The history of Cincinnati is complex, but it did build in layers over time. Starting at its basin and then moving out as concentric rings all the way into its northern, eastern, and western parts. Most of the black neighborhoods, as we will find, stayed along the routes of industry. First it was Mill Creek and the canals, and then later on, the expressways. 
that which divided the West from the East. The routes of transportation and the means to get around had a heavy, heavy impact on what determined the success and growth of neighborhoods and the people that lived there. Access to opportunities such as jobs and good education. Well, to discuss all 52 neighborhoods, let's look at it in the years they were developed. We started with 1819 and we have Cuff, The Heights, Pendleton, Queensgate, Downtown, and Over the Rhine. Here's the downtown flag. Also known as the Central Business District. This is the oldest part of our city. And also shows that we really don't have seven hills. The Mercantile Library has been built and rebuilt to ensure that people had access to self-education. It shows its level of importance. You can actually access the Mercantile Library in today's world. It is downtown between 4th and 5th Street on Walnut, just south of the Fountain Square. Get a membership and become a part of something that's a part of history. You can still visit the Allen Temple AME Church, become a member, or just go see it for its historical value. It might not be downtown, but it is still in Cincinnati. It is very important that people see different neighborhoods and different roads as avenues of opportunity and not barriers that hold them in place. There are too many Cincinnatians who don't visit each neighborhood. We need to see all 52. The riverboats fueled entertainment, profit, and war. Today you can actually use them for pleasure cruises, but have you been on one? Have you gone to a Reds game and understanding that we actually invented professional baseball here in Cincinnati? Not only just professional baseball, but the World Series. It was said to have been invented over a conversation down on Vine Street and over the Rhine. Do we too easily take for granted what the banks look like now when they were just sand and mud, wharfs, shops, places many black people had lived, which is now one of the most prominent areas of downtown? Have you been to the Freedom Center? Are you a member? New maps were drawn to erase the history of old, to show the glory show the promise and the success of its citizens. What we have nowadays is an actual place. It's called the Freedom Center. And see how it's located right in the center of the city? See it first before you see the rest of Cincinnati. Freedom is for everyone. Here at Garfield Park, not only will you find the statue of Ohio's firstborn president, you'll find a group of artists under the name tri -I -I fighting the abolition of poverty and separation between the poor peoples of our area. The streetcar, which is now free, is nothing new, but it was definitely more accessible in the past. It used to connect all the outer neighborhoods of Cincinnati to downtown. Imagine that. You should make it a point to go visit Fort Washington's location. Have you been to the top of Crew Tower yet? Taken a selfie or seen the city in a panoramic view? Cincinnati is the city where I was born. I have great pride in the city because of its importance to the rest of what America had become. We must move around and connect with each other. Different neighborhoods, different classes, different races. If we don't see outside of our own self-determined borders, where will we end up? Queensgate, the black neighborhood, also known as Canyon Bar or the Lower West End. A couple key facts about this area and places. The Harriet Beecher Stowe School, which was for black students, had been closed down long ago and is now the Fox 19 Broadcasting Building. When this neighborhood was raised for industry, 25,000 people were forcefully removed. Where did they go? 
what impact did that have on their families? Over the Rhine, also known as OTR, is one of the busiest centers of activity in Cincinnati. As a child, I grew up in a church called Bethlehem Temple. In the 1800s, it was a German Unitarian church. And nowadays, it's the transept. But I was able to see all of the changes from Washington Park to the drop-in center next door. Memorial Hall actually being beautiful and colorful inside, not just a gray mausoleum that I thought it was in my mind. And then also the future place that I would get to play, and I never thought I would make it there, Music Hall. The place where the Cincinnati Symphony would get the patrons that I would see outside of my church with their top hats and fur coats to go in droves, to be able to listen to the performance, to have their hearts and minds inspired by the actions of composers from hundreds of years ago. It didn't seem inclusive then, but it is. You have to see yourself there to be there. Take your time. You'll make it. I didn't know the people that I would meet along my journey in life would want to be in the same place. But because of our shared dream, we were able to make it there together. And for that, I give thanks. I never thought I would meet Christian Dallas. I didn't know he would be a famous muralist. I didn't know his works would be so recognized throughout our region. Have you seen his paintings? Have you left out of your neighborhood or encouraged someone else to do the same? Are you one of those people that are living in fear? Thinking that something is not for them, that you will not be welcomed. I seek of you to be that courageous member to be a part of something, just as others have done, to add your own version of beauty to the city. Open trade and commerce was key to Cincinnati becoming successful. You can find out more about Over the Rhine through the Over the Rhine Museum tours, which are offered weekly. Sign up today. Finley Market is still one of the greatest meeting hubs of the diverse different groups, classes, races, and ages of people in our city. And because of that, it should be cherished. Every time you walk up and down that street, you are helping form Cincinnati for the future. Setting an example for somebody else to do the same. Take care of our little part. Take care of each other. And try to grow. We don't need to be divided. We have to be unified. As I like to say, teamwork makes the dream work. Pendleton, sometimes referred to as the Pendleton Art District. It is a must-visit area within Cincinnati. A very tiny neighborhood that is very easy to pass up if you don't know where it is. But it contains a very unique feature, the Pendleton Art Center. And within this art center, every final Friday they have an event where they stay open past their normal business hours and open up all the galleries for you to be able to meet the artists, purchase art, and more importantly, network with your fellow neighbor. The Heights. That's our next place to visit. North of the city, at the top of Vine Street, you'll find UC, Nippert Stadium, Krishna Indian Food, Hughes High School, Crook Pool, and Burnett Woods. All very beautiful, and they all have different programs and facilities that are meant for the public. Go see how this area involves the rest of Cincinnati and you. The Cuff, the next stop on our journey. It stands for the combination of Clifton Heights, University Heights, and Fairview. Fairview is most known for the German school which used to be located there. Bellevue Hill Park and Fairview Park have wonderful views of the northern facade of Cincinnati skyline. Besides a great view, you'll be able to see a little piece of Cincinnati history in this park, Bellevue Incline, 
inclines were integral technologies that allowed Cincinnatians in the earlier years to be able to live and move around from the steep hillsides outside of the downtown basin. Right here in the corner are the remnants to the stairs to that. Don't travel down them. But just keep in mind that this area not only offers a lot of residence to the students of UC campus, but it gives great views of what the city has to offer in the downtown basin and as well as the West End. Next, we have University Heights. This is where I was born, at Good Samaritan Hospital. It is also the location of the Hebrew Union College. Mostly student housing and own homes. The next grouping of neighborhoods were formed between 1830 and 1869. The West End, Mount Adams. The East End, Mount Auburn, Camp Washington, and Walnut Hills. Walnut Hills. Despite having blue and gold in the flag, Walnut Hills High School is not located here. But in Walnut Hills, you do have more than half of Eden Park, which has always been a great gathering place for many diverse cultures and peoples for a variety of reasons. Breathtaking views and beautiful landscapes, wonderful architecture, and great history. If you're not comfortable going to camp out in the woods, this is a great start. You'll be able to get up close to nature. And just outside of the park and down the street, you have the Cincinnati Ballet, where you can go catch a performance. You might have seen me outside the park performing for the Flying Pig Marathon. The next area is Camp Washington, one of Cincinnati's oldest neighborhoods. If you're ever crossing across Hopple Street and you saw train yards out of your window, you're either going to or from this wonderful neighborhood. This is where the troops for the Mexican-American War were being trained and also used to be home to many of the slaughterhouses along the Mill Creek Valley. Citizens and entrepreneurs have been making a huge difference in revitalizing this area. You have Wavepool Art Gallery, Drip Coffee, and the historic Camp Washington Chili. I strongly recommend starting your journey with Wavepool Art Gallery and seeing what they have going on just around the corner. West End also used to be known as the Upper West End, or Little Bucktown. This is one of the areas that earlier on, and even in today's times, the majority of black families removed here due to unfair housing practices, but also because of the proximity to the Union Terminal. Many of the families have long been moved out. Many of the schools have closed down. The original residents didn't have access to travel the trains with leisure or with progress in their mind, but yet, to work on these train lines coming from the Union Terminal daily. The West End today has been fairly gouged with closed down facilities, low income housing, subsidized housing, and again a predominantly black population. If you've gone to an FC Cincinnati game, you've been in the West End. Many families, but very few job opportunities. East End Cincinnati, an area that used to be the furthest east when least until other neighborhoods started to become annexed to Cincinnati as well. It contains the oldest municipal airport in the United States, Lunkin Airport. Here, they had also delivered the first air mail. You can also find access to waterways through boats and railway through train. And these things really help build up the East End very quickly and establish a lot of commerce and trade. Historically, at least on record, there were not a lot of black people that lived in this portion of Cincinnati. But if you do want to have a little bit of a taste, I suggest going to Friendship Park. It's the western tip of the East End. It has many secrets. Mount Adams. It was formerly known as Mount Ida, which was the name of a woman who supposedly lived in a hollowed out tree washing the clothes of Fort Washington soldiers. But that was a myth. There was no woman who had lived there. This head used to be a vineyard owned by the Nicholas Longworth estate. And it actually produced some of the best wine in the world at the time. You can still see remnants of the Longworth's name throughout Mad Adams. Have you ever been to Longworth Hall? I used to perform music in this neighborhood a lot when they had the art walks.
You can also find the Cincinnati Playhouse in the park. It is under renovation, but when it opens, I hear it has the best acoustics in the entire city. It kind of looks like the shape of a piano to me. Outside of the high altitude views, feeling that skyscrapers are nothing more than five story buildings, there's plenty of entertainment and history. The Mount Adams steps are climbed each year for Good Friday. The Catholic pilgrims, they climb the stairs to give prayer, and it's been going on since 1860. Maybe you have thought about climbing these stairs at one time or another. But always remember, when there's wealth on the inside, there's poverty on the outside. The other mount is Mount Auburn. Here you have the Taft Museum, Christ Hospital, the Steps, 2020 Juvenile Detention Center, the WKRC and WWWT broadcasting stations, as well as the Christian Bible College. But did you know there are two elementary schools whose front doors face the back side of the juvenile detention center? I wonder what that does to the kids that live there in a neighborhood that already does not have many jobs for people that live within the community. Other notable landmarks are the Christ College of Nursing, Inwood Park, but more importantly, the execution site of Sam DeBose. The murder of my classmate's father had rocked my world. It was at the bottom of some stairs behind Cross Hospital, stairs that would carry us over from Mount Auburn towards the Clifton area. But after that had happened, I couldn't walk down those stairs anymore. I had to change my route and move my family. I feared for my own life at that point. In hopes that the death was not in vain, I still look towards the youth and that this message will help them be able to grow upwards and outwards. That not everything that they see is all that there is. They need to travel to. The next group of neighborhoods to become a part of Cincinnati were in the 1870s. Quarryville, Columbia Tusculum, Mount Lookout, Sevensville, Northside, and East Walnut Hills. Starting with Mount Lookout, as we see here in the flag, the observatory. This is where I had learned that we have our own time zone, or at least we had one at one time, called Cincinnati Time. Here you can study about a lot of the history of astronomy and Cincinnati's importance in the role of that science, as well as actually be able to see the telescope up close. I recommend anyone take a tour here to not only learn about the history of astronomy, but how black history was heavily involved. Please visit Alt Park and Mount Lookout Square. Two different flavors, but also if you're exploring this neighborhood, beware of private streets. East Walnut Hills. Tucked just between Evanston and Walnut Hills in Hyde Park. The origins of East Walnut Hills development are found in a small German Catholic community and the adjoining rural estates of a number of Cincinnati businessmen, which coexisted in the area beginning in the mid-19th century. You can explore this area at DeSalle's Corner, find the Manifest Gallery, or have a drink at Night Drop. And now here's a riddle for fun. Once there was a special lunch over a glass of punch, the faux Frenchman, Molly, B and me. Where were we? You can come find me at the East Walnut Hills Farmer's Market to see if you have the key. Much love. Columbia Tusculum. you find Swamp Water Grill and Stanley's Pub. A venue which I've been able to play a lot of music at, and you might be able to find me at later. Columbia Tusculum is a very affluent neighborhood. There are rules to move here. And as you go through the neighborhood, you might find the Painted Ladies' Homes. They also said that there's some painted princes, but eh, I think there's just the painted ladies. Here I am going through Almas Park, one of the most beautiful parks in the area. Great overlooks, great fauna, a wonderful Mayfest to take your kids and family. There was a shocking figure, though, as I got to go through the park, and it brought sadness to my heart. It was the statue of Stephen Foster. He was a minstrel music composer most notably from my old Kentucky home. We were both sad to see each other. His music was harmful and degrading to the culture of black people. 
Why is he here? I-74 connected east and west, but divided north and south. Cumminsville, that is. Northside used to be called Cumminsville, until it had it split from its southern part. Here you can find progressive art, and art which is also aggressive. This is home to the Cincinnati Music Accelerator, PAR Projects, as well as the Tickle Pickle. And maybe you didn't know that Knowlton's Corner was actually once the busiest area of commerce in our region. The Cincinnati Pride Parade has its origins on Northside. It has always been a strong supporter of the LGBTQIA plus community, sometimes accepting different beliefs before accepting different ethnicities. To gain further culture, the Littlefield, Second Place, the Comet, Northside Tavern, and Listing Loan are great places to visit. The Urban Artifact, Radio Artifact, and Northside Farmer's Market are great exploration places, but the neighborhood favorite is Sidewinder Coffee for all the juice. Quarryville, named after the main land owner, used to always be misnamed as Clifton or Short Vine. But places to go visit here are Mecklenburg Gardens where you can get great German food and discover the CSO's origins, Mike's music as a musician, Island Fridays for Jamaican food, Bogarts to hear your favorite band, Al Medina for shawarma, the dive bar to meet locals, or the vault for underground music, like me hearing Siri Amani from the tri for the first time. Saddamsville, home to the Fleischmann Yeast Factory, but for the most part, after River Road was widened and a 1937 flood, many of the homes in the business district were lost, and this is most of what I found. My research, I found it was the only predominantly white neighborhood in decline. And with a brief touch in Cincinnati history, the 1884 riots had taken place, losing the courthouse, the jail, and many lives. And now into the 1890s, we have Clifton, Linwood, Riverside, Westwood, Avondale, and North Avondale. Clifton. Not very diverse as a neighborhood, but it is very inclusive of different cultures when it comes to its shopping district. Sometimes just known for Ludlow or the Gaslight District, I recommend visiting Kilimanjaro or the Ludlow Tap Room. Burnett Woods has a special opening here, where you can actually go and fish. And fish in a beautiful lake without a license. Be able to grab your piece and see what the wonderful land architect of Adolf Strauch has done. The same person who created the estate grounds of Clifton, Spring Grove Cemetery, as well as Eden Park. And there is a nature center, just in case you want to learn a little bit more about the wildlife. Right. Just west of Saddamville and further down River Road 50. Here you can find Anderson Ferry, which has been going on since 1817. I have yet to ride the ferry but there are some people that commute across the river every day by means of this ferry, especially going to the airport. Avondale, a place near and dear to my heart. It represents the struggle of the diaspora of the African peoples in so many ways. At this historic site, Rockdale and Reading Road, there is a statue of Abraham Lincoln, and this is also the location where the 1967 riots had taken place. A person by the name of Lasky was accused of being a Cincinnati strangler, and his cousin, protesting at this statue, was arrested for loitering. After his arrest, the neighborhood erupted. The years of over-policing and brutality in the neighborhood by the police. Everybody had just gotten fed up. Shops were burnt down, merchandise was destroyed. It forever scarred this neighborhood and the perception that people had of it. No more than a year later, we have the assassination of Martin Luther King and the 1968 riot of Avondale. People were hurt and disgusted and angered, burned shops and merchandise, yelling and crying. After these two nights of civil unrest and pain, two people had lost their lives. 220 more were injured, and 260 were arrested. Most notable areas in Avondale are actually for family and children. The Cincinnati Zoo, as well as Cincinnati Children's Hospital. 
But while we are visiting these areas, do we think about the people that reside in Avondale? What led to their businesses closing down? What led to their level of poverty? Outside of Over the Rhine, I saw some of the most beautiful murals here that really represented the people and their voices. Voices that weren't always heard, usually muted out. I remember performing at the community dinners and meeting the people that lived there, and they just wanted to be heard out. They just wanted to be heard. For family-friendly things, visit the Civic Garden Center or the Hirsch Recreation Center. Next on our journey is North Avondale. The roots of this neighborhood were set by Robert Mitchell, where we get the name Mitchell Avenue. He designed a subdivision for the Jewish-German people who were not being accepted in the social circles of the city of Cincinnati, so they decided to form their own. Undamaged by the 1960s riots, they formed a community group to combat redlining and blockbusting. Despite many families leaving during that time, they've maintained their prestige and a balance of community. And have a true treat as a CRC member. Visit the one that's in North Avondale. This is a great neighborhood to walk around and be inspired. Find out how the community is connecting. Westwood. This is number one in population and in geographic size for the city of Cincinnati. This is the home of James Gamble of the Procter & Gamble. Can you believe that this area was once sparsely populated with the estates and farms of the wealthy? But that since then, that space has definitely been filled in. Check out Muse Cafe, Westside Brewery, and the new door zone that will be coming soon here. There are lots of locally owned businesses and venues to enjoy. The building of the Western Hills Viaduct, the incline, and also the pressure to leave downtown after the 1884 riots help with the growth of Westwood. Linwood, a very small neighborhood next to the river. Upon a visit, stop at the Brew River Creole Kitchen. You might be able to catch Cheryl Renee, a local blues legend, and on occasion, I might be beside her playing too. Other notable places to visit, the Otto Armletter Memorial Park and Reeves Golf Course. Not much else. This small neighborhood's growth can be attributed to its location on the Little Miami Railroad, which has been closed for some time. The next segment of growth came about with Lore, West, and East Price Hill, Bond Hill, Roselawn, Spring Grove Village, Evanston, California, and Hyde Park, all in the early 1900s. Hyde Park, an exclusive neighborhood to shop, walk, and raise a family. Just as other neighborhoods with very high successes, Hyde Park gained its prowess from two major things, successful businessmen moving into the once rural area and a rail line constructed by Norfolk and Southern that connected this neighborhood directly to downtown. Many of Cincinnati's top schools are in Hyde Park, Kilgore Elementary, Withrow High School, Hyde Park School, Clark Montessori, Summit Country Day, Cardinal Pacelli School, St. Mary Grade School, and the Springer School and Center. To get a taste of Hyde Park, you must visit Hyde Park Square. Here, you will find great local businesses such as one of the oldest Graders ice cream parlors and the Hyde Park Farmer's Market, which is open weekly. Just to give a little bit of a sense of how far this neighborhood has grown, here's what Rookwood Commons and Pavilion Shopping Center used to look like. The smokestack is still there from the original site. Roselawn. Growing up as a child, it was always a bright spot in my day to visit there. This is where I learned how to play the violin. At one time in history, this was a Jewish neighborhood, but currently, it is a black neighborhood. More than 20% of the population is over the age of 65. And due to high traffic volumes, super fun sites, and other toxins, there's a high disease rate. Sparse history makes it seem like no one cares. What should we do to help this community become a safer place to live? East Price Hill, the second largest of the Greater Price Hill conglomerate. Home to the beautiful Mount Echo Park.
East Price Hill used to be one of the most sought out places to live, not just for the views, but for the neighborhood. And in 1987, they were one of the 12 national finalists for Neighborhood of the Year. This boost was provided by its own incline and access to the city through the 8th Street Viaduct, which is still present today. For a great taste of history, dine at the Incline Public House. You won't be sorry. West Price Hill. What's interesting about this neighborhood is actually the second largest in Cincinnati, but it's also somewhat equal to East Price Hill. It contains Elder, Seton, and Dater schools. East Price Hill's history doesn't show that it was very diverse. You can see from the school photo as an example. Lower Price Hill. Small and quiet. The smallest of all of the Price Hill segments, but also a home for Price Hill Well. Evanston. Named after Evanston, Illinois. Did you know that this is the actual home of the famous Walnut Hills High School? As a Cincinnatian, did you know that the O'Brienville Shopping District is actually in Evanston, not a separate neighborhood. My go-to place to visit has always been Cream and Sugar Coffee Shop. Great staff, great brew, you can't ask for more. Spring Grove Village, formerly known as Winton Place, but had its name changed in 2007. It's a little bit north of Northside, but most notably known for containing Spring Grove Cemetery which is the third largest cemetery in the U.S. There used to be a direct railway line for passengers from this neighborhood to the Union Terminal. Bond Hill. This is the neighborhood where I actually reside. It has some diversity, but it is predominantly a black neighborhood. Due to unfair housing practices, there was only one black family living here in 1964. But by the time of 1978, the neighborhood was 70% black. We might not have our own coffee shop yet, but we do have a renovated CRC with the caring staff, the Makatiwa Country Club and Golf Course, and an FC-sponsored soccer area for the youth. Rumors are afloat that downtown business firms are planning to move to Bond Hill to utilize the new Mercy Health Building. Will it benefit the community? California. Yes, we do have a California in Ohio, and it is named after the state. It's most noted for Coney Island, which has its own dark history and segregation. Segregation did not stop in the Coney Island area until a brave woman, Vice Mayor Marion Spencer had faced discrimination with her family, and she, along with the NAACP, had sued and won their lawsuit, desegregating the park indefinitely. Her bravery secured rights for us all. But what if she never had spoken up? Was the Mason-Dixon line real or just propaganda? As an elected official, she faced discrimination openly. What of the others in the city, like her, without a position of authority. If you are ever out in the area, I personally recommend Deadlow Brewery, the California Nature Preserve, or Riverbend Music Center. Being close to the river definitely helped this neighborhood grow. Have we uncovered any black neighborhoods that had the same access to waterways or passenger rail lines? These six neighborhoods joined in the year 1911. Mount Airy, Mount Washington, Madisonville, Salem Park, Pleasant Ridge, and Carthage. Pleasant Ridge. Originally, this area was called Crossroads, and it was utilized by European invaders as a strong point to prevent indigenous land reclamation. Did you know that a main road of this neighborhood was originally an indigenous trail? Ridge Road was this trail, and it stretched from the mouth of the Little Miami to the present-day city of Redding, Ohio. Here is also the home to Lasanaville Country Club and Golf Course. You will also find the New Pleasant Ridge Entertainment District, 
community happens here, Pleasant Ridge CRC, and the Pleasant Ridge Chili. What if all of the main roads of Cincy were once indigenous trails? The truth is most of them are, and some were the same trails used by slaves escaping to the north. Mount Washington, currently the easternmost neighborhood of Cincinnati. Diverse in local businesses, but not diverse in people. Easy access to jobs and to downtown. The most prominent feature and landmark of this area is the Mount Washington Water Tower. It contains nearly 3 million gallons of water. This neighborhood, once a part of Anderson Township, has a vague personal history. Madisonville, originally just called Madison after President James Madison. You can find me playing music at the New Summit Hotel. Upon my journeys further into Madisonville on foot, I found a cemetery with civil rights leaders. They had been moved, of course, but I was not able to access the property without an escort. Upon calling the Baptist Church in charge of the land, I never got called back. There is an indigenous trail here at Moaning and Wetzel Avenue, and that's where the first home of Madisonville was built. Carthage, most known for the amount of car dealerships and also the offensive indigenous sign on Anthony Wayne pointing to one of them. You might have driven through Carthage and did not know. In the 1960s, it used to be popular for horse racing. The only landmark I was able to find was this, which was attached to this, the Carthage flagpole. And that is exactly what it is, an interesting looking flagpole that they said had come off of a hotel that had burnt down. Pine Street is the main artery of traffic. In the past, the trolley used to connect directly with downtown. The metro is what's in use today. The community is kind, and to enjoy great food, please visit El Nuevo Valle, wonderful Mexican cuisine. This neighborhood is one mile south of St. Xavier High School, and the trains only pass through, just as many Cincinnatians do. This is the home to the Hamilton County Fairgrounds, which are barely used today. This neighborhood is ethnically diverse, but not economically diverse. Mount Airy. It also contains Mount Airy Forest. And this was the childhood home for local Major League Baseball star Ken Griffey Jr. The water towers are definitely a prominent landmark. Have you been to Mount Airy Forest? Have you found the treehouse there? This park is very unique because it was one of the first major reforestation projects in America and it is Cincinnati's largest park at 1,500 acres. Within this park, you can also find one of the region's few disc golf courses. Go meet a new tribe of people today and learn that sport. Sailor Park, the westernmost part of Cincinnati, and also home to Home City Ice. You've probably had their product before. Making it out to Sailor Park, you are in for a treat with the scenic drive down West 50, also known as River Road. But make sure you stop at the Buddha Barn Thai once you get there. It's a great dining experience and great place to meet locals. The next group of neighborhoods to join Cincinnati are Hartwell, Oakley, Kennedy Heights, Paddock Hills, and College Hill from 1912 to 1923. Hartwell, named after John W. Hartwell, the Vice President of the Cincinnati, Hamilton, and Dayton Railway. Located at the intersection of I-75 and Ronald Reagan, it is the northernmost neighborhood of Cincinnati. Here you can find the best African and Jamaican cuisine at Taranga, or the best bookstore, the Friends of the Library. The people of Hartwell are diverse and have a lot of pride. I hope you get to put your heart in the Hartwell soon. Oakley. It used to be known as Four Mile during the days when it had horse racing. And this was also the home of famous Annie Oakley, a markswoman of the 1800s but the city is not named after her, more so the oak trees. Places to visit out here, Oakley Cinema and Crossroads Church, Mad Tree Brewery, last but not least, Aglamisi's Ice Cream. Throughout its history, Oakley has always been a travel destination and it is very accessible through public transportation. Kennedy Heights, a neighborhood that is representative of the changes that it believes in. The area got its start from the encouraging of families through white flight 
to move away from the city center, especially after the 1884 riots. In 1963, the neighborhood started to push integration practices, and I can personally account for the inclusivity and commitment to diversity and community here. I strongly suggest visiting the Kennedy Heights Art Center and or checking out one of their Art in the Park events every Wednesday in the summer. Next neighborhood is Paddock Hills, named after Judge A. Paddock. A very small and beautiful neighborhood, it has always been a crossing point for the citizens of Cincinnati. Initially, it was a transit crossing from the Erie and Miami Canal. Later on with the train, there was a train station that was at the intersection of Paddock Road and Tennessee Avenue. Currently, it's a crossing point between Bond Hill and Avondale. While you're here, you can find Avon Fields Golf Course and Driving Range, as well as Avon Woods Nature Center and the Blue Gibbon Chinese Restaurant. College Hill. It was formerly known as Mill Creek Township. 491 acres of land, owned by William Carey. Carey's son opened Pleasant Hill Academy, which was for boys only and later became the Farmers College. In 1852, the Ohio Female College was built separately. In 1873, it was changed to the Cincinnati Sanitarium, the first U.S. psychiatric facility not on the East Coast. While here, visit Brink Brewery, the College Hill Farmers Market, Fox Preserve, or Marty's Hops and Vines. Another example of how historically access to travel and transit helped build the success and affluence in this area. Coming into the 1930s, we have the Great Depression and the divisions of North and South Fairmount, South Cumminsville, and English Woods. North Fairmount. Originally, it was farmland, and the current residents actually still carry that tradition in the form of urban farming today. This neighborhood has great potential, but needs a lot of help. It is difficult to travel across the neighborhood because of the steep terrain and limited bus routes. What can we do to help our neighbors? South Fairmount, the separation from the north. Here, you can actually find the Harrison Viaduct, which was built in 1908. And some history that might be different, but for the most part, it is the same exact history as North Fairmount. The one thing that really stands out about this community is that it has the highest percentage of Section 8 housing in the county. South Cumminsville the part that was broken off from Northside. This was the childhood home of my favorite baseball player, Dave Parker. The neighborhood being historically an African-American community has always been treated as separate. It's been left out of the growth and progress of the rest of the city. Here you'll find attractions such as Millville Apartments, Wayne Playground, CSX Train Yard, and Mill Creek. English Woods. A history erased or undocumented all I can find is that it used to be a federal housing project in the 1940s. The personal history I have of this place is of a lot of four-family apartments and a high-rise, that of which my father would visit every other Sunday and help an elderly man out who had no other family. Almost all physical traces of this neighborhood are gone, torn down or abandoned. Can this be the answer to the affordable housing crisis here in Cincinnati? Why not rebuild? and renew here. The last four additions, Winton Hills, the villages of Roll Hill, East Westwood, and Millville. Millville. The name comes from Mill Creek Valley, but the locals might call it Moosewood. Did you know that Cincinnati is ranked fifth highest in the nation in child poverty? And that Millville, as a neighborhood, is known to have our most impoverished children in Cincinnati. It is also a food desert. The youth and the neighborhood really need our help. East Westwood. There's not much to say about it except it is east of Westwood. It is one of the newer additions to the city of Cincinnati and a recent break from Westwood itself. Winton Hills, formerly known as Winton Terrace. This neighborhood is a predominantly black neighborhood today, but when it was first founded, this was an all-white neighborhood, or should I say a whites-only neighborhood. They did not allow black families to move here 
until another segregated community called Finletter Gardens was built further up the road. Housing and food programs were never started to serve the African American communities. Stigma goes away when the truth is revealed. The Villages of Roll Hill, formerly known as the Fay Apartments. There is virtually no history about this neighborhood or the people that live here. If you look it up yourself, you'll just see that there are future plans to renovate the neighborhood or what money has been invested to renovate it in the past. Is this how black people and black neighborhoods are treated? Should we not be seen? Should we not be believed? If too many of us decide to live in one area, will we just be divided from the rest? Here is a map of Cincinnati neighborhoods that from the past did not make it to the present. Here is where we are today, Cincinnati. This is a map I came across doing my research and was provided to me by reading an article by the Cincinnati Enquirer. You should be able to find this map as well. It shows Cincinnati's most segregated neighborhoods. Do you currently live in one? Will you choose to stay divided or will you proudly go see all 52? I hope to see you around town. Thank you.